say for the sake of argument that you're writing a kid's book. And maybe you want this kid's book to teach a lesson, like it's okay to be different. And maybe you want to dress up this lesson in a fun, colorful story. So instead of having your book be about people, maybe it's about shapes. And you write your story about shapes and you have this whole extended metaphor about how we don't need to fit into all of the shapes that society says we should. And it's great. And this is all well and good, right? But what if your message wasn't as innocent as it's okay to be different? What if your message was, it's not okay to be different? Being different is just for attention and it's better to listen to what your parents say and go along with what everyone else does. And what if that message, like yours, was dressed up in a fun story about shapes or talking animals and it didn't just come out and say in big bold letters, just be normal? That's the funny thing about metaphors. Metaphors are used all the time to teach concepts and moral lessons, but because they necessarily have to be separate from the concept they're helping to explain, often metaphors are used to obfuscate more negative arguments. If you want to hide an argument that might not be seen as politically correct, one way to do that is to hide it in an analogy. That way, if someone points at it and says, hey, that story is just telling kids it's bad to be gay, then you can respond, no, it's not, it's just about shapes. Metaphors and analogies. And as a note, throughout this video, I'm gonna be using analogy and metaphor pretty much interchangeably. They aren't exactly the same, but for our purposes here, they are close enough. Metaphors and analogies aren't inherently bad. They are fundamental to kids' stories and we have been using them literally forever. Aesop's fables are full of simple analogies comparing human behaviors to animals and natural forces. And the Christian Bible is full of parables comparing people to mustard seeds and lost sheep. But metaphors aren't just poetic, cryptic riddles and puzzles that hide secret meaning. In fact, according to cognitive linguist and my personal academic fave, George Lakoff, metaphors create realities for us. Metaphors can be self-fulfilling prophecies. Essentially, we have these cognitive frameworks that we use to make sense of the world, and metaphors are a fundamental part of those structures. When we use metaphorical language, like calling drug enforcement a war, or referring to time as currency that we can spend, that actually shapes how we think about drugs and war and time and money. Now, this is something that I have wanted to make a much bigger video about for a while, so I'm not going to get into the details here, but basically, metaphors shape how we think about things, and how we think about things affects how we act upon things, and then our actions can help shape the world around us, which then reinforces those metaphoric frameworks. So metaphors can be used as camouflage to hide harmful messages, and they can fundamentally affect not just how we think about things, but also the reality of things. With that in mind, let's talk about conservative kids' books. Before we jump into things, I would like to give a quick content warning. In this video, we are going to be talking about systemic racism and gun violence and transphobia. Because this is a video about kids' books, why would we not be talking about those? <laughs> but if those are topics that you would rather not engage with right now, then that's all right. Go ahead and skip this video. No hard feelings. But with that out of the way, let's jump in. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but Obviously, metaphors aren't just used in conservative kids' books. Progressive and left-leaning kids' stories also use metaphors, because of course they do, because everyone uses metaphors all the time, especially in kids' stuff. But I am not talking about those in this video. I am talking about these particular books and the particular metaphors within them. If you are especially upset by that, then comment down below and demand that I make a similar video about leftist kids' books. And if you really want me to do that, then make sure to give the titles of some of those leftist kids' books that you find especially egregious. Anyway, <laughs> today I am going to be looking at More Than Spots and Stripes, Paws Off My Cannon, Elephants Are Not Birds, and Johnny the Walrus. And just like the kids' stories of old, these books are acting as fables. They are acting as extended metaphors or analogies for bigger issues. 
Before we can really break down these metaphors and see if they work, we first need to have some kind of test to measure the strength of metaphors. The strength of metaphors and analogies comes from how similar the two things being compared are, and more importantly, how relevant and accurate those similarities are. So for instance, this is why a lot of analogies for race are super clunky and don't always work. Often, people use alien species or magical species or literally just different animal species as race metaphors. But race just isn't anything like species. Different species are fundamentally biologically different. But that is not how race and ethnicity work in our world. Race, the way most people think of it, isn't biologically based. There is essentially no difference in the DNA of people of different races. Studies show that there's actually more variety in the DNA of a single racial or ethnic group than there is across racial or ethnic groups. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this, but if you're interested in exploring more of the dangers of race analogies, then I recommend checking out the Lindsay Ellis video on Bright and Jack Saint's Zootopia video, both of which I have linked in the description. Anyway. In addition to judging the strength of the metaphors in these books, while we're looking at them, I want us to ask ourselves, what are the implications of these metaphors? If we take them to their logical conclusions, what do they reveal about the author's worldview? So let's jump in and take a closer look at some of these metaphors so we can get a better understanding of exactly what kind of weird kids propaganda these publishers are peddling. The first book we're going to be looking at is More Than Spots and Stripes, written by conservative comedians The Hodge Twins. The story follows Rebel, who is a spotted cheetah, and she races alongside other spotted and striped cheetahs at school. But while Rebel is preparing for the big race, she's told by an older spotted cheetah that those striped cheetahs are cheaters. In the past, they used to throw banana peels on the track to trip the spotted cheetahs up, and now, even though they're no longer throwing banana peels, they're still, somehow, cheating. The older cheetah tells Rebel and the other spotted cheetahs that instead of training for the race, they should protest against the striped cheetahs because they're making the race inherently unfair. When the day of the race comes, Rebel comes in last place, and she realizes that she was tricked by the older cheetah into focusing on being angry at the other cheetahs instead of training. She vows to stop blaming others for the acts of their ancestors, and learns that it's hard work, not the pattern of your fur, that determines your success. This is a book about race relations. Get it? Race? Because it's about a race? Like a racetrack? <laughs> And its message is built on the metaphors that life is like a track race. It is something that you can train for, that has a clear end goal and winner, and racism is a distraction that is meant to trip you up, either as a metaphorical banana on the metaphorical racetrack of life, or as a conspiracy being peddled by older generations. But this metaphor doesn't really work, because clearly not everyone has the same end goal in life, and it's not really something you can train for either. Some people are born at the finish line, born into wealthy families, and they won't ever have to work if they don't want to. And the rules of the race aren't a great stand-in for systemic racism either. Laws and the enforcement of those laws are squishy. They're incredibly complex, and they're hard to pin down. That's part of why systemic racism is so insidious. It hides between the lines. A track race has, like, two or three rules max, right? <laughs> but what are the implications here? Well, these metaphors work to reinforce the idea that the U.S. is a meritocracy. It's all about hard work and individual responsibility. There's no such thing as systemic racism, and the people who are telling you that there is are just trying to distract you so they can take advantage of you. If you work hard enough, you can win. And if you complain, you're wasting energy that you could put into hard work. So don't complain if you feel like something is unfair. Before we move on, there is one more metaphor that I want to look at in this book. They compare the throwing of banana peels onto the track to overt racism, like during the Jim Crow era. Racism that happened in the past, but they don't do it anymore. But at the end of the book, when Rebel is running in the big race, someone throws a banana peel onto the track. They acknowledge that overt racism still exists and still affects people. But 
This metaphor breaks down too, because the banana peel could trip the striped cheetahs too, like they're all racing at the same time. It's not like it's just something that spotted cheetahs are susceptible to. So it doesn't even work as a racism analogy, it just utterly fails on every level. This book is not good. <laughs> I don't know if we were expecting it to be good, but it is not. This next book is about gun control, because kids aren't learning enough about guns these days. You'd think that kids would know plenty about guns, what with all the school shootings that no one is doing anything about. But no, you're totally right. Kids should learn more about how gun rights are integral to maintaining a safe, citation needed, safe society. Sure. So this book is Paws Off My Cannon, and it's from the same publisher that published the last one. But this book is written by Dana Lesh, a radio and TV host, and also at one point a spokesperson for the NRA. So we know that this book about gun control is gonna take the most fair and balanced look at the issue. And she was also a writer and editor at Breitbart, so she definitely knows a thing or two about moderate, even-handed writing. Anyway, the story itself is pretty basic. There's an idyllic village where everyone eats cupcakes all day, but then they get overrun by evil hyenas who shoot everyone with coconut cannons and steal their cupcakes. Half of the village says that they should arm themselves with coconut cannons to defend themselves from the hyenas, and the other half of the village says that no, they should just put up little wooden signs that say no cannons, and then the hyenas won't be allowed to bring their weapons into the village. Well, they can't agree, so they separate into two different villages, and then the hyenas invade again. They take the cupcakes from the wooden sign side, who then learn that they do need coconut cannons to defend themselves, and then when the hyenas come back later, they shoot them with their cannons and scare them off and get to eat their cupcakes in peace again. Now, one metaphor that I think is interesting is that Dana sees gun control legislation as a wooden sign, which, to be clear, it isn't. There are many differences between legislation, something that usually comes with some form of action and oversight, and simple signs, which are literally just some words built on hope. But the more interesting metaphor that I want to look at in this story is how Dana compares hyenas to criminals, specifically criminals who commit armed robbery. Both criminals and the hyenas in this story break the law. They are using weapons to take things that don't belong to them, and they are hurting other people in the process. But listen to how the villagers describe the hyenas. Hyenas were the only bad thing about living in Mushroom Village. They were lazy and didn't like cooking, so they roamed around looking for a sweet meal to steal. This reveals some added depth to the analogy, because it shows us exactly what Dana thinks about people who commit crimes. This story is teaching kids that we need guns to defend ourselves against lazy, bad people. People who you know are bad by how they look. People who are bad because of some inherent biological nature. People who do bad things just because they're lazy and don't want to work. When we stop to think about the implications of this metaphor, we can start to see the logic behind the conservative position on crime. If criminals are like these lazy, dangerous, inherently bad hyenas, then of course the solution is to either lock them up or shoot them. They're bad, that's all they are. Now, I know that these kids' books are oversimplified on purpose. That is the whole point of analogies and metaphors in stories. Most kids' media has one-dimensional bad guys. But in a country where gun violence is so prevalent, I think that we can afford to be a little bit more nuanced. We never stop to ask why the hyenas are stealing the cupcakes. Maybe they're starving, and any time they've tried to talk to the villagers, the villagers totally shut them out. We've never seen either party try to talk to the other. The problem is guns, so the solution is guns. Those are your only two options. Now, the next ones that we're going to talk about are Elephants Are Not Birds and Johnny the Walrus. This one is a double feature because both of these books are about gender ideology. And while they tackle it in slightly different ways, there's enough overlap that I decided to lump them together and break them down simultaneously. So, Elephants Are Not Birds is another one from Brave Books, and it was written by Ashley St. Clair. Ashley St. Clair 
fun fact, was kicked out of Turning Point USA because she was photographed at an event headlined by white supremacists and neo-Nazis. And also, here's a definitely totally unrelated picture of her getting a friendly headlock by Nick Fuentes. Like that Nick Fuentes. So she was too radical for Turning Point USA. So she wrote a, a transphobic kids book. Great. I don't see how this, I don't, I don't see how this could go wrong. <laughs> anyway, this book is about Kevin the Elephant, who really enjoys singing. And because he enjoys singing so much, our villain, Culture the Vulture, tells him that maybe he's really a bird and that only his feelings show what is true. And yes, the villain is literally named Culture. This isn't even a metaphor. This is just out loud. <laughs> While Kevin dresses up like a bird, tries to do bird things, realizes that he doesn't enjoy being a bird and just can't do a lot of bird things, so he decides to go back to being an elephant and tells off culture for trying to lead him astray. Similarly, we have Johnny the Walrus by Matt I Don't Know What a Woman Is Walsh, who you may know from his transphobic and willfully ignorant documentary, What is a Woman? In this story, Johnny is a little boy who enjoys playing pretend, and when his mom takes a picture of him pretending to be a walrus, the nefarious internet people tell her that he's a real walrus. So she takes him to the doctor, who gives him a list of things he can do to be more walrus, like putting on body paint and eating worms and potentially at some point getting surgery to turn his feet into fins. Johnny is clearly miserable while doing all these things, but his mom continues to make him do them because of the pressure from the internet people. Until she takes him to the zoo to see the other walruses, and she gets a dose of common sense from the self-insert zookeeper who tells her that she needs to focus on protecting her son, not forcing him to be a walrus. So she and human Johnny go home happily ever after. Both of these stories compare gender to animal species, which similar to race analogies that I mentioned earlier, just isn't accurate. Gender is how we think of and express ourselves. It's not what chromosomes or body parts we have. That's a whole other thing. Species, the difference between humans and walruses or between elephants and birds, is fundamentally biological. You can tell what species something is by its DNA. But that's not true of gender. Gender is socially constructed. Species is not. As Parrish Turner says in his article for the School Library Journal, This metaphor plays into dismissive attitudes about transgender people being out of touch, or even mentally ill. It is a cliché I have experienced myself. When my coming out is met with the response, Oh, and if I say I'm a dog, I guess we're all going to accept that now? This implies that two such assertions are the same. Yet there is a marked difference between wanting to be another gender, considering the range and complexity of human gender, and wanting to be another species, something that is impossible. The one animal yearns to be another construct, at its heart, is a misunderstanding of what it means to be transgender. Or, as Dana Simpson, author of the Phoebe and Her Unicorn series, puts it, It doesn't really work or make sense as a metaphor for being trans. I get why someone would think it did, because that's a lot of people's understanding of being trans. You're one thing, but you want to be another. But that's wrong. The point of coming out as trans, at least for a lot of us, is to better express who we are already, not to become something else. Gender isn't species. It's not some objective, biologically innate thing where becoming something else requires a magical transformation. Gender is just a spectrum of different ways to be the individual human you are. But let's take a second and think about what this implies. In these books, the main characters are attempting to be something fundamentally different from what they are. They're trying to do something impossible, and we're supposed to see that as a failure. Like, in Elephants Are Not Birds, Kevin tries to do a variety of bird things while wearing fake wings and a beak, and all the other animals give him dirty looks for trying to be something he's not. And we're meant to laugh at his silly ideas like eating seeds or fitting into a nest. Of course he can't do those. He's an elephant. So it follows that we're supposed to laugh at trans people. Look how funny they are, trying to be something they're not. That looks ridiculous. It's gross. And the same thing happens in Johnny the Walrus. He covers himself in paint, which looks silly, and eats worms, which, yuck. We're supposed to think that being trans is gross. 
The gender equals species thing has been around for a while, but there was another metaphor in both of these books that I actually hadn't seen before. Both books suggest that being trans is easy. It's like playing pretend. It's a fantasy that people latch onto because they don't want to do the difficult thing of just sucking it up and being what they were born as, even if it's hard. Kevin the Elephant daydreams about being a bird and getting to sing songs all day and not having to lug carts around town. If he were a bird, he wouldn't have to do any of that. And Johnny is just playing pretend and people shouldn't take that seriously. The implications of this are really interesting. To these people, being trans is like idealistic. It's a fantasy, a daydream. It's taking the easy way out. You're too weak to be a macho man? Become a woman. Is it too hard to deal with the beauty standards that come with being a woman? Just be a man instead. It's just so infantilizing and condescending. In both of these books, culture, either literally culture the vulture or the internet people, is what convinces these kids or their parents that they should be something different from what they were born as. It doesn't come from the kids, it comes from outside. And this really reveals what they think about trans people, right? Like, they think that people couldn't possibly come to the conclusion that their gender is something different than what they were assigned on their own. They think that trans people only exist because of peer pressure from society, and this just is not true. And it's also kind of sad. Like, it shows that these people don't really trust their kids, or any kids for that matter. At the end of Elephants Are Not Birds, Kevin, now an elephant again, tells Culture the Vulture that he is most free when he trusts what is true. And this, on its surface, is great. Teaching kids to trust their intuition and listen to their feelings is awesome. But that's not actually what is happening here. At the beginning of the book, Culture the Vulture convinces Kevin he's a bird by telling him, it's only your feelings that show what is real. Now, at the beginning, Kevin doesn't have the feeling that he's a bird. Culture puts that idea into his head. He just knows that he likes singing. But that aside, what is the real difference between that statement that we're supposed to disagree with and trusting what is true? There's this weird difference between feelings and what's real or true. Kids are being taught not to listen to their feelings. Kids are being taught that their feelings aren't real or true. They're being taught not to trust what they feel. They need to trust what is true, but their feelings aren't what is true. So what is true? Where does truth come from? I think that the folks who wrote these books would argue that truth comes from parents and the Bible and, of course, the wonderful literary masterpieces published by Brave Books. I just find it really insidious that they're trying to undermine kids' trust in themselves. They are teaching their kids that if they question things, they need to hide those questions. They need to blindly trust only a few select people and deeply mistrust everyone else, including themselves, if they have concerns or questions about what they're learning. It's just gross and sad. That's my rating. <laughs> One star. It's just gross and sad. Zoe B. <laughs> Professional critic. The one silver lining is that even in the metaphor, they still fail. In Elephants Are Not Birds, Culture the Vulture says that Kevin needs wings to be a bird. But that's not true. There are birds that don't have wings. Kiwis don't have wings, and they are so cute. They are some of the cutest little birds. I love them so much. This doesn't make the gender equal species metaphor suddenly magically work or anything, but it does show that even in their made up kids story, their transphobia is built on faulty assumptions and disproven ideas. Transphobia doesn't even make sense in the fantasies of transphobes. Now, before I move on to the next section, I wanna mention another book real quick, just cause it's wild. One of the brave books that I read was called Fame, Blame, and the Raft of Shame, which was written by Texas State Representative Dan Crenshaw. And it's about a scourge that is absolutely taking over our schools, something that is a 
genuinely concerning issue among all six-year-olds. Cancel culture. Anyway, the book is about a stand-up comic making a joke in bad taste, and so they get cancelled and tied to a raft and thrown up to the surface, because the city is underwater for some reason. Like, it's an underwater city under, like, a big glass dome. And eventually, they cancel so many people that there's too much weight on top of the glass, and it begins to break and, like, almost floods the city. But then, the protagonist stands up for the cancelled people and pulls them back down, and they repair the city together. It just really goes to show you how big of a deal they think it is to be cancelled. They see themselves as these incredible martyrs that are saving the whole world from being drowned by wokeness or whatever. It's not that good, and it's not even offensive or anything. I just think it's so funny <laughs> that they take cancel culture so seriously. That's all. I just, I had to tell you that this thing exists. <laughs> Metaphors are powerful, but these kinds of moralistic analogies are still mostly consigned to fanciful stories about talking animals. But a little birdie told me that there's actually a whole wild world of conservative propaganda books for kids out there. Is the little birdie thing too much? Is that bad? Who knows? <laughs> it's my video, I can do whatever I want. Anyway, here's Jose. There are so many more of these books that act like thin veneers over the most trite conservative propaganda. Traditional children's stories usually have simple morals like why it's good to share. Conservative ones are more about explaining why feminists are awful or how Donald Trump is some kind of awesome caveman. And one of the most striking things I noticed in these books is how they often aren't much more sophisticated than the arguments you hear out of the average conservative pundit. Zoe and I both looked at Matt Walsh's book and the arguments in it were about as sophisticated as the ones he puts in his transphobic movie, where he annoys a bunch of academics with his inane questions. I fully went into this expecting to read kids' books with stripped-down versions of arguments you'd hear from conservative pundits, except they weren't stripped down at all. They're as sophisticated coming out of those guys' mouths as they are in these books. In my video, I go into a little more detail about the sort of arguments that these books make and how they seem less interested in helping kids grow and more interested in just telling them what to do. And some of these books get really wild. If you thought Dana Loesch's Paws Off My Cannon was rough, I highlighted one book that's all about telling kids about the joys of the AR-15, and how putting the silencer in a scope on a gun is a lot like adults playing with Legos. It's dire stuff. So when you're finished with Zoe's video, why not give my own a shot? Back to Zoe. Is that a good segue out? How do I segue out? This is hard. Uh, end of segment. There, that's a good one. So if you want more of that, be sure to check out Jose's video, which I have linked in the description, and I can confirm, I've read some of the books that he talks about in that video. They are fucking wild. Metaphors are important. They help us conceptualize the world and teach challenging concepts. But because they can become self-fulfilling prophecies, we need to be really careful with how we use them as educational tools. As education scholar Sean M. Glynn puts it, when teachers, authors, or students intentionally or inadvertently compare features that do not correspond to one another, misunderstanding and misdirection result. An analogy easily can lead students down the wrong path. In other words, the kinds of metaphors that these kids' books peddle and that I've spent the past 20 or so minutes exploring are inaccurate, but that makes them dangerous. When kids grow up thinking about racism or gun control or trans rights through the lenses of the metaphors that these books use, they grow up believing that systemic racism isn't real and that the US is a meritocracy and that bad people should be stopped with guns and that trans people are delusional and disgusting. We need to be incredibly careful with the metaphors we use in these contexts because, as George Lakoff puts it, these political and economic metaphors can hide aspects of reality. But in the area of politics and economics, metaphors matter more because they constrain our lives. A metaphor in a political or economic system, by virtue of what it hides, can lead to human degradation. The metaphors in these books, by virtue of the lies they tell about racism and gun violence and trans rights, can do real damage. 
Now, I'm not saying that all metaphors are evil or we should never use analogies, and I'm not even saying that metaphors are these ultra-powerful tools. I'm just trying to make it clear that the language we use does have an impact on how we think about things. Like, mentally, our linguistic choices affect our cognitive frameworks and vice versa. So we just need to be careful. These kids' books aren't the most heinous evil out there, but I hope that by going through them, I've helped to highlight some of the nuances that writers use to instill different ideologies. So I guess that I just want to leave you with a call to just be more conscientious about your metaphor usage. Keep an eye on political rhetoric that frames things as wars or describes abstract concepts in physical terms, because it's more important than you think. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. This one was a lot of fun, and like I said in the video, this is really just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to metaphors and cognitive frameworks, so be sure to let me know if that sounds like something that you might want me to cover. Uh, and I still am working on my videos about Squeakor and the one on the American Monomyth, but I'm also moving in a few weeks, so those big videos are sort of being nudged down the road a little bit until I have the time and energy to like make them as good as they deserve. And also, thanks again to Jose for being a part of this video. Uh, check out his video, which I have linked in the description. I have a little cameo in his, and he talks about some of the books that are like wild, just absolutely wild. Like, go go watch his video. Also, uh, editing Zoe here to say that I forgot to mention in the video, but huge thanks to Jesse Gender and Neil from The Liberal Cook for lending their voices to this video. You can find their information in the description below, and I have it on good authority that they are both working on some pretty exciting and ambitious projects coming up soon. Um, Jesse has a video about the Matt Walsh documentary, and Neil at the Liberal Cook, I know they are working on the most ambitious crossover event in cinematic history, so be sure to go send them some love, tell them Zoe sent you, and give them lots and lots of all of the love and joy that they deserve in the world. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> I also want to give a huge shout out to my patrons and channel members whose names are scrolling here beside me. And an especially huge thanks to A Tasty Snack, Adam, Dylan, Justin Lowry, Robert Bradford, Science Punk Sellout, and Will Swanson. This video just would not have been possible without you folks. If you would like to join them and get perks like early access to videos and joining our patron-only Discord server or getting custom written poems, just for you, then be sure to check out the links in the description to see how you can become a patron or channel member. And finally, our patron poem of the video. For Claire Brown, here is All Snails Go to Heaven. She was an alien on the drain pipe. Spiral shell, sand mottled and cracked, long eyes protruding into the gloom, tentacles smelling and feeling and searching the air, Searching for what, I wondered. She stretched her slime-drenched neck back and out and out into the rain to be baptized. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. <sighs> Desmond desperately wants to come in. again that people latch on to just because that's now charlie crying at the door <sighs> charlie i hear you i do thank you and it's also kind of sad <sighs> that's charlie playing with a toy goodness charles stab it